Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight always. Amen. Please be seated. And in our psalm today, you know why I use that as my regular introduction for a sermon. Every wisdom is in scripture. I was quite taken as we were reading today. From the psalm again, who can know their unwitting sins? Who can know their unwitting sins? It speaks to last week, doesn't it? That we might strive as much as we can, but in trying to purge ourselves of sin, of trying to make ourselves right, we'll end up losing our lives. Our lives will go before us and we will miss the things that God wishes to show us. My Lenten group this week read the story of the cleansing of the table. Uh, and Eunice, it was a challenging reading, wasn't it? Jan, we just sat and said, this feels like a different Jesus. What is going on in this text? And we know full well it's not a different Jesus. So rather than taking the easy path and trying to just read past it or wrap it with a pretty bow and make it neat. Let's explore what Jesus is doing in this place. He says to the people selling doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. I wonder, did you imagine as you heard that reading what it might have looked like? The outer circle of the temple, cattle being bartered, sheep ready to be sacrificed out the back, tables of people changing currency. It'd be a bit like a fate or a fair when we have them. Rest assured, I'm not going to say that we shouldn't have fates or fairs. And I wonder, in the temple, how did that begin? I wonder, how did that begin? When did it become a practice? I can't very well imagine a group of high priests gathering and saying, do you know what? I think we should actually just make it easier for everyone and get a whole bunch of livestock into the temple itself. And we'll need money changes because there's a whole bunch of currencies. So let's just set them all up in our temple. That's a great idea. Doesn't sound like how that would emerge, would it? By a consensus or a committee. Somewhere along the line, over time, this practice had emerged. Now, there was a real need here. It would be a mistake to look at this reading and say the people of the temple were doing the wrong thing and deliberately did so. And that's what Jesus was arcing up against. Because I think that would be to miss the point. These practices emerged because we're talking about the Passover festival where people would come far and wide to join the temple and the celebrations and to be a community. A good thing, yes? to celebrate God together and to celebrate the Exodus. So as the city got bigger and more urban and less rural, as it became less about people gathering from farms and less about itinerant people coming together, as it became a celebration happening in an occupied place in a Roman and Greek society, things have evolved. And so, this is not history, but I can see perhaps having those animals there made it a bit easier for people to make the requisite sacrifices. And the sacrificial practice at that time was really important. It was about making people making themselves right so they felt they could approach God so they could actually reconcile 
with one another and with God. They could give thanks for the abundance they had given with the first fruits in the sacrificial process and for those things that they had got wrong. They could make amends. And so to enable that seems to be a good thing. And we know in urban life, it's not like everyone would have a bunch of cattle or sheep with which to do the required practice. So you would think for people coming and travelling a long way, not having to bring a sheep would be good. For people in the city who did not have farms, it would be very helpful to have those things. And for the poor in society, there was a provision for them too. They could use the doves. Jesus' own parents were able to redeem him with a couple of doves. It was the poor person's choice and provision. And you know full well what it's like being a church and a group of people gathering for God. Then the practicalities start, don't they? How are we going to manage this? How do we arrange ourselves? We're going to need to reimburse the people bringing in the livestock. We're going to need to manage payment. And so the money changers join the group because at that time there was all sorts of different currencies and weights of coins. And then some side benefits emerge. There's a potential for some profit there's a temple that has been in construction for 46 years. We've done a lot of building on this site, haven't we? We know it costs money. We know it costs money and we fundraise for it. And that is good and proper to make provision for people to gather and encounter Christ in our midst. And as that convenience grows, as that potential for making money to support worship and temple life grows, these tables, these animals become closer and closer and closer into the temple and God's own residence in the Holy of Holies. They enter the Father's house. The whole world worked this way at that time, these things seem to be necessary, making things easy for the people that would come to sacrifice, to make amends with their God, to give thanks, to seek reconciliation as a community. Ah. <sighs> <sighs> Frogs in a pot. We've heard the expression, haven't we? When things just creep up on you and the heat is turned up and you can sit blissfully unaware that anything harmful or out of the ordinary is happening. The beauty, however, of that process of sacrifice that had emerged from God with God's people was quite the opposite. It was close and real. You gave your first fruits. So of the crop you grew, you gave the first pickings, the first harvest to God. That sacrifice became a tangible reminder that all abundance was from God. In your flock, you would find the perfect example you spent time to find the perfect sheep, the best of the best. And that was what you offered God. And what we read about in this story doesn't feel like that anymore, does it? It doesn't feel real. It doesn't feel relational. It feels like a transaction and a market place. You could say, well, it's more urban now. Things have changed. Time has moved on. That's how it is in this day and age. It seems like, to me, it crept up 
on them. So I'm not saying here that money or currency is bad. Don't take that as the point, or fundraising is bad. Do you notice, though, that when we start getting into transactions and budgets and money, we can be separated from what is real? We talk about some days that our children have no idea where milk comes from. They're so separated from the land. They don't understand the costs of living today in a real sense of connectedness. How much more here when those tangible coins of that marketplace today become a swipe of a card today? How much more separate are we again from the reality of God's abundance and provision? And notice of all things, it was the tables of the money changes that were flipped over and coins scattered. It had become a practice that you had to pay to have access to God. And then we think about the doves. Imagine charging the poorest to have access to God. But that was all they knew. That was all they knew. And they must have looked on bewildered when Jesus started that commotion. What is he going on about? Just what does he expect? Jesus did something shocking. It shocks us as readers today, doesn't it? It's shocking. It's shocking and that is the point. We've got an expression in Australia, haven't we? To crack the whip. What does that mean? You get the cattle going. You wake everything up. You get things moving. Wake up. Wake up out of your stupid little frog and get out of the pot. It's pot. It's time to move on. That's the prophetic tradition. And again, this is where we need to understand and be immersed in the Hebrew scripture. Prophets are shocking. And they have to be. They're talking to nations that have fallen asleep. And if you want to go back and have a look at what the prophets do, they declare God's word and intent and they tell whole nations to repent, to come back to God. And to do that, they need to make a scene. Hosea married a prostitute who would cheat on him multiple times and he keeps bringing her back in. Ezekiel cooked his bread over feces and had to negotiate with God about how shocking that act would be. These are the stories of the Hebrew scriptures about prophets. And remember, John the Baptist was out in the wilderness eating locusts, honey, and wearing camel hair. Shocking. That was shocking. When a whole nation of people are in a deep inertia, it takes a good shock to get a reaction. Cracking the whip. It should serve for us as a church to remember that we might need the shock of a whip to get us to wake up. It would serve us well as Christians in our broader society to know that we are called to the prophetic voice that we may need to crack the whip to be shocking, to wake people up. Because it goes to what the psalm was saying, the insidious sin. The insidious sin is the one that creeps up on you and you have no idea it's happening. The insidious sin is the hardest evil to tackle. The insidious sin is the one we can't peg on an individual and say, you're a sinner. How much did we hear that in the gospel? You're a sinner, so I'm going to dismiss you. But institutions can sin. Corporations can sin. Nations can sin. And it creeps up on you. The Old Testament is full of ways in which the nations were led to sin by their leaders. And that 
was the work over and over again. And how often was that sin? Leaving behind the poor, neglecting the widows, leaving behind the marginalised. So perhaps we're still frogs in a pot. Last week we talk about, talked about our own individual sin and our need to repent and how that work can't be done alone and how if we try to make it on our own, we will lose our lives. They will just fall behind us. If we prioritise still individual repentance, we miss a very large point. At that time, the people in the temple were restoring their own lives behind, before God, and that ended up being a marketplace. They were making things right. And the temple, the institution that should have led them and nourished them and equipped them to come before their God, missed the point. Missed their own people crying with the need to turn back to God. The whole nation needed to turn back to God. And the temple was built for 46 years and a marketplace formed and money was exchanged. If you want to go one step further, in those outer perimeters, that's where the Gentiles may well have been meeting God, the provision for them to worship. Can't afford a dove? Oh well. Better luck next year. The prophetic voice needs to challenge us. And here I mean us at St Mark's. And here I mean us as a country. And here I mean us as a world church and as individuals, you and me. There's a need out there. There's no excuse. We walk a balance point because we need to establish and have a place for people to gather, don't we? For the person who is looking to encounter Jesus, where might they turn? Here. Where might they find their community? Here. Where might they make friendships and be loved and nourished? Here. And the work is not for the building. The work is not for a legacy. The work is not to continue this place into the future. The work is to participate in God's mission. Our giving is to participate in God's mission. And so, such a timely reminder as we move this year into bringing together some of our strategic plans for the future of this place to remember. We are participating in God's mission. Keep your eyes open wide. Don't hesitate to challenge something you see that is taking us away. Together let's hone our prophetic voice in the world. And don't ever let us slide into inertia where we fail to see what God is calling us to do. In the name of Christ. Amen.